Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special presentation of the Fly Arts Center. Today, we will be reading the book Step Right Up, How Doc and Jim Key Taught the World About Kindness, written by Donna Janelle Bowman, illustrated by Daniel Minter. And as you can see on the screen, I have the cover, cover of the book right here. I also have a physical copy of the book that I will be reading from uh, so that you'll be able to see the illustrations as I read through as well. All right, let's get started. Spring 1889 stretched a blanket of wildflowers over Shelbyville, Tennessee, but William Doc Key barely noticed. He paced and fidgeted like an expectant father. He had been on hand for plenty of births before, but this one was special. Visions of a future champion racehorse darted through his mind as he comforted his mare, Loretta. Finally, a dark, wet colt lay shivering at her side. Doc knelt to welcome the little fellow, but something was terribly wrong. Well, he's the most spindly-legged... He's the most spindly shank legged animal I ever did see, he said. Most folks would have given up on the colt right then, but Doc had a kind streak that ran clear through his heart and all the way back to his childhood. William Key was born into slavery in 1833. As a child in Shelbyville, he was full of questions about the world. In some parts of the United States, educating an enslaved person was a crime. Even where it was not forbidden, many owners did not want their enslaved people to be educated. But John and Martha Key, William's masters, like several others in Shelbyville, thought differently. So the Keys allowed William to join their sons for lessons. Learning gave William a sense of freedom. From time to time, William, from, from time to time, from, from the time William was about six years old, it was clear he had a special way with animals. No matter how wild or rascally the animals, William befriended them and tamed them. He especially loved horses. A few years later, William's masters started sending him across Bedford County to work with other farmers' ornery animals. During these travels, William saw some animals, saw how some animals were neglected, beaten, and worked to death. He was gentle and patient with them instead. He thought nothing was worse than being hurtful. William learned all he could about caring for the injuries and illnesses of animals and people. He paid special attention to his mother, who taught him how to distill roots and herbs into homemade remedies. As William worked at different farms and businesses, his doctoring skills developed and his reputation grew across Tennessee. By the time he was a young man, William was so good at treating injuries and ailments that everyone started calling him Doc Key or just Doc. In 1865, the Civil War ended and Doc built a new life as a free man. He married and bought his first patch of land in Shelbyville. It was perfect to build his new horse hospital. Doc also perfected his own line of medicines, including Keystone Liniment, which could be used to treat both horses and people. After the war, many formerly enslaved people faced racism and prejudice from white people who would not recognize them as equals. Doc decided that the best way to beat the prejudice he encountered was to try and make friends with everyone and show them he could be a successful businessman. 
he eventually opened up a blacksmith shop, a wagon and wagon wheel and harnessing shop, a restaurant, and a hotel. He even built a racetrack and dreamed of race of raising fine racehorses of his own. Doc's Keystone Liniment became so popular that he bought a medicine wagon, hired entertainers, and hit the road. He sold his medicines in towns across the South. Soon, Doc was one of the wealthiest men in Shelbyville. One day, as Doc and his wagons, wagon clattered through the dusty town, he heard about a run-down circus in Tupelo, Mississippi that was trying to sell its horses. As he neared the ragtag circus, Doc spotted a scrawny gray mare. She looked neglected and abused, and she walked with a limp. Despite her sad condition, Doc recognized that the mare was a purebred Arabian, a horse breed prized for its intelligence and speed. Doc bought the horse named Loretta for $40 and welcomed her into his family. Doc lovingly nursed Loretta back to health. When she was strong again, he paired her with one of his fastest racing stallions in the country. Doc hoped their offspring would grow up to be a champion racehorse. But on that spring day in 1889, the sight of a sickly colt almost broke Doc's heart. In an instant, Doc's racing dreams for the newborn horse vanished. For weeks, the young horse could barely walk. Friends urged Doc to put the colt out of his misery, but Doc wouldn't listen. Just as he had nursed Loretta back to health, Doc vowed to keep her colt. He dished out just the right food and medicines. He massaged the colt's knobby legs, groomed his shaggy coat, mulled over the perfect name to give him. The biblical name that Doc had chosen for the racehorse did not fit the wobbly youngster. So Doc just called him Jim, Jim Key. Under Doc's care, Jim's health improved. His curiosity grew. Jim seemed to study Doc's every move, even when Doc played with his dog. Then one day, Jim zigzagged over with a stick dangling from his mouth. Doc laughed and tossed the stick away. Jim stumbled after it like a clumsy dog. He was a no-one coat, I tell you, Doc said. He showed me he could fetch and proceeded to do the other tricks that dogs could do. Jim learned to sit, play dead, act sick, and roll over on cue. When Jim was about a year old, Loretta died. Doc was heartbroken, but he also worried about Jim. The orphaned colt needed looking after night and day. So Doc coaxed Jim up the porch steps and through the front door of his house. The young horse made himself feel right at home. When Doc counted money, Jim watched. When Doc wrote letters, Jim watched. When Doc opened and closed drawers, Jim watched. Pretty soon he began to pick at me, trying to imitate me, Doc said. In time, Jim's legs straightened and then he muscled up. He grew into a handsome young stallion, much too big for the house. Doc knew it was time for his four-legged house guest to move back into the stable. But Jim kicked up a mighty ruckus until Doc started sleeping on the cot next to Jim's stall. Then Doc moved in his desk and most of his office. Before long, he was practically living in the stable with Jim. When Doc was ready to hitch up the medicine wagon again, he decided to bring Jim along as his newest attraction. Doc held up a bottle of Keystone Liniment 
and announced for people to gather around. He told the crowd how his sickly, crippled colt had grown strong and healthy. And right on cue, Jim pretended to be sick. He limped and drooped and snorted and wobbled. Then Doc gave Jim a spoonful of medicine and rubbed a dollop of liniment onto his legs. Suddenly, Jim acted well again. He pranced around, frisky as a pup. The audience, of course, clapped and laughed and lined up to buy Doc's medicines. Back at home one day, Doc's wife walked into the stable, munching on a snack. Jim, do you want a piece of apple? She asked. Jim nodded his head up and down. Mrs. Key ran back to the house calling, Doctor, Doctor, the horse can say yes. Doc began to wonder what else his horse could learn. The stable transformed into a horse-sized classroom. Doc painted sugar on a cardboard square marked with the letter A and held it up to Jim. A, 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 Doc said. Jim swiveled his ears and listened, and then he licked the card until it was soggy. Doc created a new card out of tin. Every day, he patiently repeated, A, 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 as he slipped the card between Jim's lips. For weeks, Jim just licked the sugar and stared blankly at his teacher. Doc sighed and shook his head but he kept at it. After six months, Jim finally understood. If Doc called for the letter A, Jim grabbed the right card and dropped it into Doc's hand. In no time, Jim learned to fetch the letter B, the letter C, all the way to the letter Z. Doc was proud. He rewarded Jim with an apple or a sugar cube for each correct answer. Next, Doc had Jim combine letters to spell words, choose numbers to make sums, find flags to identify states, move clock hands to tell time, and a whole lot more. When it was time for Jim to learn to write, Doc painted Jim's name with sugar on a blackboard. It took months for the horse to learn to lick the pattern of his name. Then Doc slipped some chalk between Jim's teeth so the horse could write his name. The chalk crumbled. They needed a bigger piece. Seven years passed quickly in Jim's private classroom. The more kindness Doc heaped on him, the more willing the horse was to learn. Doc was now ready to show the world what Jim could do. Their chance came in, in 1897 at the Tennessee Centennial Exposition, a huge fair held in Nashville. Doc had been asked to help plan a building where African Americans could showcase their art, culture, and inventions. Doc asked the fair directors if he could exhibit Jim. At first, the directors laughed. A horse that could read, spell, write, and do sums? Ridiculous! But as one of the organizers of the fair, Doc insisted that Jim have a stage of his own. Some visitors were strolling past the giant seesaw and past Edison's new moving picture machine to see Jim. Throughout the fairgrounds, people chattered about the remarkable educated horse. During one special show, Doc greeted the pack crowd, then turned to Jim. Jim, can you show me where President McKinley sits today? Jim strutted the center stage, faced the President of the United States, and bowed. Then Jim walked over to the card rack, scanned the name cards, and picked out the one marked McKinley. A gasp <sighs> echoed through the room. Audience members began shouting out requests for Jim, spell this word, divide them numbers, get that card, file that letter, ring up this sale. Jim did it all 
without a mistake. He even wrote his name on the blackboard, J-I-M-K-E-Y. People couldn't believe their eyes. How could a horse learn to do such things? The whip makes horses stubborn and they obey through fear, Doc explained. Kindness, kindness, and more kindness. That's the way. After the Tennessee Centennial Exposition, Doc and Jim went on the road again. This time they had a big time promoter, Albert Rogers, to arrange the performances for them. News of Jim's remarkable skills spread across the country. Admiring reporters began calling the horse Beautiful Jim Key. The name stuck. Doc and Beautiful Jim Key performed around the country. But the farther south they traveled, the more racial discrimination Doc faced. Often he wasn't allowed to eat in the same restaurants, sleep in the same hotels, or ride in the same railroad cars as white people. Sometimes Doc and Jim weren't allowed to perform because people didn't believe Doc's claims of the horse's skills. When Doc offered to perform for schools in Cincinnati, Ohio, a school board member replied, well, we can't close our schools for horse shows. And people didn't know, and people who didn't know about Doc's gentle training methods worried that Jim might be abused and performing out of fear. After a while, Doc and Jim caught the attention of humane societies, groups of people who were committed to ending the cruelty toward animals. Like Doc, Members of humane societies believed that animals were intelligent, capable of emotions, and willing to learn if treated well. They deserved protection, and beautiful Jim Key was the perfect animal to represent the cause. A portion of the ticket sales for Jim's performances was donated to the humane societies. The money was used to buy horse ambulances and rescue cranes, fund educational programs, and buy books about animals for libraries. With their growing fame, Doc and Jim were helping to promote the cause of kindness towards animals. Albert Rogers worked hard to get Doc and Jim onto prestigious stages. In New York, they performed in their own Broadway play, a scholar and a model office boy. Jim played the parts of a student and a clerk. He answered the phone rang school bells, identified colors, made change from a cash register, filed letters, and more. At a performance in St. Louis, Jim showed off his math skills. A man called out, Jim, if you were to take seven, multiply it by three, add nine, divide by three, then subtract seven, what would the answer be? Jim paused for a moment and picked up the card with a three. Well, the man jumped to his feet. You're wrong, Jim, he shouted. The answer is seven. Jim shook his head. No, no, no. The audience hurried to do the math for themselves. It turned out that Jim was correct. The answer was three. People asked Doc if any horse could learn the skills that Jim had mastered. And he said, yes, providing that the animal has not been abused. By 1898, school districts around the country had decided that Doc Key and beautiful Jim Key were perfect examples of education and kindness. They canceled school days so students could see Jim perform. Children lined up to compete in spelling bees against the most widely educated horse in the world. In St. Louis, Missouri, Jim won by spelling the word revelation. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, he won with the name Isaiah. In Baltimore, Maryland, he won by spelling the word physics. Other cities came up with different words to test Jim, and most times, Jim won. Around the United States, about two million children stepped right up to sign the official Jim Key Pledge, I promise to always be kind to animals. 
Doc Key and beautiful Jim Key were now famous. Record-breaking crowds packed coliseums, theaters, and music halls across the nation to see them. In every city and town, thousands of people bought tickets to attend Jim and Doc's performances. Sometimes police officer, officers had to step in to control the mobs of enthusiastic fans who gathered. Doc and Jim were invited to perform on stage where only white, where only white entertainers had been welcomed before. Doc would not accept the segregated seating that forced African Americans into the worst seats. He insisted on special performances with equal sitting for all. The property owners agreed. They couldn't argue with the most popular attraction in the country. In spite of Jim's many skills, skeptics tried to prove that Doc and Jim's act was all a hoax. They scrambled the letters, mixed up the numbers, scattered the colors and flags. Nothing seemed to fool Jim. In 1901, an investigation was conducted by professors from Harvard University. They studied Doc and Jim's performances, looking for signs of trickery. They asked Doc many questions. Some say it's hypnotism or that kind of a thing, but I don't know anything about that, Doc said. But I do know that Jim knows and does what I ask him to do. The next day, the Boston Daily Globe newspaper printed an article with the results of the Harvard study. The professors came to the conclusion that there were no tricks or hoax. It was simply education, they said. By 1906, 73 year old Doc and 17 year old Jim were worn out. For nine years, they had traveled the country and now it was time to go home to the rolling hills of Shelbyville where they could continue to learn and play together. They had proven to millions of people what Doc Key had always believed. With kindness, anything is possible. And that concludes our reading of Step Right Up, how Doc and Jim Key taught the world about kindness. Written by Donna Janelle Bowman and illustrated by Daniel Minter.